I think you can go ahead and get started. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. So in this talk, we'll be challenging you to the concept of embracing extinction or dying, die trying. We're going to travel back in time and take a dive through ancient waters as we compare the current PID landscape with the Cambrian period in the history of life on Earth. We argue that like the Cambrian, there are many similar niche dwellers in the PIDS world. So PIDS that have been developed to meet the needs of specific communities or disciplinary practices and leveraging new technologies. As we hear more calls to simplification of the landscape and consolidation around a few or sometimes just one PID system, why not embrace diversity instead? Instead of seeking to narrow our field of innovation at this critical moment in PID evolution, perhaps we should embrace diversity instead while designing for extinction. So let's begin our nerdy journey in the future. Next slide, please. To be precise, in 2021, January 28 at 8.31 a.m. Brisbane time, which is for most of you in the future. <laughs> if you're in Europe, North America, or pretty much anywhere else except New Zealand. So back in 1999, when Morpheus offered us the red pill to get to the truth of reality, or the blue pill to live in a machine generated dream world, we took the blue pill and now we're living in the matrix. So imagine being in lockdown without the digital technologies that we have to inform us, to keep us connected and to keep us a bit hidden from reality as well. How much harder that would be for many of us to live, um, especially with little persons at home with us. Our rapid embrace of digital technology has in created incredibly fertile ground for innovations and transformations across the research world, from exascale data to the digital humanities. So if we look at some of the key digital trends, they include the rise, oh no, back please, Josh. Back please, Josh. He's going too fast for me. He's rushing through. Um, so the rise of social networking that enables research communities to collaborate, build relationships, share ideas and overcome distance. The mobile computing and mobile working that allows people to blend all aspects of their digital lives, allowing research to be conducted and communicate from a range of locations. Analytics and big data, the combination of widespread data capture, data mining, machine learning and large scale cloud computing that already being hailed as a revolutionary technology. Consider the Internet of Things, the network of physical objects or things that are embedded with electronic software and sensors that enables these objects to collect and exchange data. Real opportunities for research and all of those things. Uh, next slide, Josh. So from the matrix of the present, we travel back in time as we're reminded of the Cambrian period of Earth's past history. The Cambrian marked an important time in the history of life on Earth. It came about after an ice age and at the time when most of the major groups of animals first appear in the fossil record. So this event is known as the Cambrian explosion because of the relatively short time over which this huge diversity of life forms appears. And similar to the Cambrian period, the novelty and potential of our current new technology environment has prompted the creation of new entities and many variations in the ways that we identify them. Next slide, please, Josh. So the explosion in technical diversity of entities applicable in research has brought about an aligned explosion of PIDs, as well as the diversity and the niches that that brings. So we haven't got one, but we've got many PIDs. Sometimes we have many PIDs for the same research entities or objects, and sometimes we have just one PID that's very precious because it identifies something very unique. It has a very unique niche purpose. And the list of PIDs for these different aspects of research keep growing. Over to you, Josh. Thanks, Tash. So I think another way of putting what, what Natasha just said is that we're kind of, we are blessed with this bewildering array of identifiers. And, you know, we've got so many, I mean, look at that picture. What, what the hell does that thing do? Um, how do you figure out what the, all of these identifiers are? And for most people, they do not know. Um, they, are, they are confronted with this. They don't know which identifier to choose. They don't know how, what, what to do with it if they get it. And this is a critical uh, risk, I think, for us. Um, at the same time, 
this is a quote from some research I did recently for a, for a, for a project. Um, there's a presentation on it tomorrow from the PID Federation. Um, people complaining about the proliferation of identifiers and not understanding this. And they're saying, you know, why do we have so many PID providers making the same thing and apparently believing they'll achieve better results compared with their competitors? With all of them building their own infrastructures, soaking up energy and resources to, to, to address the same different versions of the same problem each producing their own access rules. And you look at that thing um, swimming around on the screen there and you think, is that really something that's necessary? And I think that perception in the community is really critical for us. Um, we have to ask ourselves, are we really helping? Uh, again, these are quotes from sympathetic folk, PID users, PID enthusiasts, people who want us to succeed. And they're looking at us producing this kind of weird millipede earwig eye maggot thing and they're kind of going what's this for how does this interact so they're saying these there are more PID systems arriving they're not aware of what's already been done they're replicating work they don't communicate well outside their own communities and now so a lot of these times some of these systems just don't interoperate together and as somebody said this is just not good and you know the problem with having so many different providers is that no one is really in charge of coordinating that and that lack of coordination shows in the level of you know, overlap and competition. And when you have PID providers coming along saying, no, use our identifier for this thing, and someone else saying, no, use our identifier for the same thing, it creates an impression of a fragmented, competitive, um, non-collaborative environment. And actually what you see when you come to things like PIDapalooza is how collaborative we really are. But that is not how we look from the outside. If you step out of the pit bubble, um, it's, it's a very different impression we've managed to give of ourselves. And that's something we really need to be thinking about. So the alternative perhaps is maybe we pursue a monoculture. Um, you know, just the same identifier stretching out to the horizon in all directions. And, you know, somebody, again, I'm not endorsing the idea that the handle system would be the one, but a couple of people did. Somebody said the handle system should operate as the equivalent of DNS and everybody should just build their own integrations on top of it. We should not be developing all of these different identifier infrastructures, systems, standards. So that as an alternative kind of on the one hand definitely offers the advantage of stability and predictability. Um, and I guess a certain level of simplicity, but you know, you look at all of these weird and wonderful life forms crawling around in the primordial ooze, and actually, you know, they have evolved to serve particular niches. Though there are spaces in that evolutionary landscape that they are occupying and thriving and filling, and they have a role to play in that ecosystem. And I think that's worth thinking about. If you, to take the analogy back to pits. That you know, com community specificity breeds trust. It re breeds responsiveness. If you're close to your community, you understand it. The other point here is multiple redundancies are a source of resilience. And for some people, that's worth the complexity. These are all counterpoints to the arguments I was just making a moment ago. It's not a simple question, but a lot of those weird kind of isopod looking things all wriggling around on the surface of the mud, they might be occupying a similar spot in uh, the evolutionary ecosystem that they occupy. And if one of them is just perennially too thick to realize it can't crawl into, an, into a volcanic vent and evolve before it cooks and evaporates and is gone, then there's something else to come along and eat that algae and stop it building up. Finally, here's the thing. If you were there back in the primordial lose, what would you have picked for a winner? What would you have said is still gonna be there in 10, 20 million years? You would not have been able to say. So much as, uh, you know, in this predictions generator, you have the option to choose a different future. I would ask you guys, how's your crystal ball these days? Which of our identifier systems is absolutely future proof? Which one can we, can we put all our eggs in one basket? I would argue that perhaps just as, you know, this prediction that we'd have geofenced autonomous vehicles for Freudian therapists, which is probably pretty desirable. Um, what would we, what, what, what would we choose from our PID landscape to be that geofenced autonomous Freudian vehicle? And on that question, I'll pass over to Adrian. So then what are some of the limits of this diversity? Uh, in most kind of uh, evolutionary systems, 
there are limits if you evolve so much off into one corner that you can no longer breed that's usually a dead end um, not to be designed for um, if you can't interact in a in a standard way with other species in the ecosystem so if you develop a flower that's very specialized in shape then uh, you can't benefit from the standard sort of pollination techniques that develop in, in that ecosystem. So that's the ability to interact with other species. Um, and then for complex, you know, things that have communication, if you develop in such a way that you no longer have mutual intelligibility, then also you're um, not benefiting from the, the group. So here are just some obvious things that say, uh, whilst we need diversity for the health of the system and we can't really predict how the environment will change um, you wouldn't want to absolutely design for for uh, failure so i'm not saying design for failure we're saying design for success so there are some things within the PID system that um, relate to these kind of uh, limits of diversity which we'll see on the next slide First one is this uh, idea of uh, uniformity and interoperation, and particularly to do with what I was saying in the previous slide of how you interact with other, um, what would you call them, you know, uh, other members of the ecosystem. So the pollinators is a good example here. If the PID systems become too diverse, then who actually pays? It's the research community that pays for that the costs of this di uh, uh, too much diversity or uncontrolled diversity or uncoordinated diversity. So that's what we really probably really need to get is that right balance between the diversity and uh, uniformity. So if I'm uh, the, vice the vice president of a, of a university or a vice chancellor of a university and you want me to engage with Persistent identifiers, you've already got used up, you know, 10 seconds of your half, uh, 30 seconds with me. If then you need to explain to me the 100 different types of persistent identifiers that the university should engage with, you've probably, you know, your elevator pitch, uh, you're already at the top floor before you've even started listing the, the huge var uh, variety. So that even just culturally to get people to engage with uh, identifiers if we present something that's just way too complex uh, there's one for you know identifying uh, the offices in your building and there's a different one for the chairs and there's one here a different set of totally different kind of identifier for every part of the research system then culturally we're going to have a, a, a big um, uphill battle technically uh, there is if we are too diverse amongst our PID systems, then again, it's the research groups and the research institutions that have to pay for that uh, variety. So again, as Josh was saying, we're just looking for the right balance between diversity for health and um, uh, resilience, uh, but we don't wanna to put too much of a cost. So um, an earlier talk, uh, Todd was talking about how to get the metadata from a persistent, persistent identifier service. If you want to do that at the moment, there, there is as many ways of doing that as there are critters on, this, on the screen right there. If, I, if I've got the identifier and I just want to know uh, the name of the thing that's identified, I would have to have about seven different adapters to my query to say, uh, if it's this, then uh, query this uh, technical system and even the interface to that technical system, if I wanted to get the name of the thing being identified, I'd have to adapt it to speak to the ORCID systems and adapt it to speak to the IGSN systems to get back that simple piece of information about the name of the thing being identified. So that's a huge cost for the developers, for the technical people, for the uh, systems that is borne by by our, our pollinators. And if we're not careful, uh, we you know, it's an ecosystem. If we um, don't treat them, them right, give them a, a standard 
uh, way of interfacing with persistent identifiers, then that cost will be um, uh, problematic for us. Um, I can't see that at the bottom of my own screen there. What's the last dot point I've got at the bottom of the culturally, technically, financially, I think it was. Um, financially, Correct, yeah. if, yeah, if I need to, uh, again, as a researcher, research organization, research group, uh, institute, uh, if I need to pay money to 17 different organizations through either a subscription or a membership or founding something, if I need to put uh, resources in you know, as in kind to help to operate something in lots of different uh, areas, again, we're going to be providing a complex uh, set of even just accounting to, to um, maintain uh, these PID systems. So they're the, they're the costs, and so that's exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to have a, the healthy set of um, of uh, diverse uh, bid systems that are really in touch with the different communities and the niches in which they develop. Uh, but again, we want to then coordinate that diversity to present some kind of uh, uh, unity to the rest of the ecosystem. Next uh, slide, please. And then the next one is really just, you know, given that we are in the middle of uh, pandemic and, you know, potential, you know, global depression and uh, economic depression and um, at very least a shock to the uh, research system and education system in lots of countries, uh, we are going through a time of scarcity, you know, resource scarcity and uh, collaboration will be important um, you know, within our community to um, also uh, just make sure that we, we don't go off into uh, so many tribes that we can't bring, come together and bring a unified voice to funders, to research organizations. Um, so again, that, that would be another element of the uh, limits of diversity. Uh, I think uh, this is just meant to be a provocative talk to you know elicit some ideas and there's lots of uh, stuff happening over on the uh, the uh, chat there so probably good actually if we um, just go to because there's lots of other aspects to this uh, look the take home message is we don't want to end up like the Cavendish banana that uh, a really good banana so tasty I must say I love it uh, you can't fault it except for the fact that everyone thinks that and it's just everywhere in the world and then there's this one strain of panama disease which um, potentially could wipe out all, you know all our bananas um, so you wouldn't want to design uh, for such an outcome and uh, in our, this formative stage of the persistent identifier systems globally we'd want to learn from those and make sure we've got a good balance between diversity and unity yeah, and I think um, Natasha just pointed out in the chat that um, humans uh, also share about 70% of their genes with the banana. So maybe we fall in that same category of we don't necessarily want to design ourselves into extinction. But I mean, you succeeded. I will speak on behalf of the chat. Um, you succeeded in being provocative and using a really great metaphor or whatever the right term is to explain a lot of the big challenges that we have as a big community, as a PID community. Um, and it is this like grappling of the benefits and the rewards and all of the good stuff, but also the risks and the long term, you know, disadvantages of all the diversity around um, PIDs. And I think one of the big things for me actually came from an ARDC led um, event that um, my team at CDL helped to work on in, in Portland, where we just sat, we spent a lot of time talking about how the world doesn't really understand why there's so many PIDs. And when you start to talk about being uh, talking about the them as individual things or individual brands, people think that there must be some competition or something bad happening, and that consolidation must be the future. And um, so there's like this 
public relations problem, but then also when you really boil it down, maybe there is actually some problem. Like maybe it isn't like, you know, we can't just act like it's all, uh, uh, it's perfect. Um, it's very thought provoking. So I really appreciate you kind of bringing it to the conference today. So I don't know if there are any specific, there weren't questions, but there are quite a few thoughts. There's a lot um, going on in the chat there, isn't there? I thought um, some of that stuff around perhaps there's a, looking at the stakeholder and community alignment is one of those key things and how we can maintain, we can align and kind of consolidate on the community facing end whilst maintaining inclusion, which means kind of providing pathways for lots of different communities of practice to have access to pit services and see their needs reflected in our product development. It's, a really, it's, it's an interesting challenge, I think. Yeah, one of, one of the challenges though for me is um, I do agree that PID should be based around communities and communities of practice, but the reality is there are an infinite number of communities and communities of practice. So mm -hmm. saying that doesn't necessarily solve the problem that you're, you have exposed, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm with you and I agree, but I'm also not sure that using that as the formative thing is going to solve this problem. It actually is in some ways, the reason why we're in this mess is because we are finding more and more communities that say we're special. Well, it's a lot of it arises from those communities. Um, so a lot of this stuff kind of has, has arisen organically from a, a need within a particular group. So they've just kind of gone and built the thing they wanted to see. Um, and I think it's finding ways in which, um, I think it was Chris Schiller made some points about um, kind of having some core frameworks um, that are really well communicated, that people can then build their unique, I don't know, um, five-eyed, clam-toothed, squiddling on top of. Um, but actually it fits as part of that ecosystem. And I sometimes wonder if something like the kind of co-opetition model that you see where DOIs are like that for publishers, right? Um, publishers cooperate to get their DOI services and their core infrastructures, and then they compete in different areas. So there's something about that model, I think, might be a great way of approaching this because it gives us some flexibility, but it means that we're strengthening our common, you know, the common foundations of our ecosystem. Yeah, I think um, one thing I would say is um, resolvers and resolution services is a great example of this. Like we, it's a very stable and you know portion of our of what bids need to do. They need to resolve. Um, so why is it when um, identifiers.org and into team and launched the compact identifiers project four years ago, the world did not flock to have them resolve identifiers. Um, and we had a talk earlier today that was that exposed some of that, which is it's not just about the technical side of things and the PIDs people, like a session numbers, you know, like didn't go flock to that infrastructure. It's also the researchers. They just, if you put identifiers.org slash something slash in a session number, they'll go, what is this? You know, they'll say like, I don't even know what this is. So it's kind of like, um, it's a double-edged problem. And I don't know if it's, it's, it's like even resolution itself and handling of identifiers is something that is both the, the user side of things as well as that technical backend. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of stuff coming up in the chat around building awareness and communication and our articulating um the kind of the core value proposition of what we're trying to provide uh, but being able to kind of couch that in language that particular groups of users might understand or find more more appealing i guess is an interesting challenge there um tash and adrian do you want to have you got anything to say um yeah i, I think what's interesting for me is um just the discussions that I have with this um, around uh, some of the people that I work with where, you know, if you come from an IT perspective, you just say, why isn't there just one PID for everything? It should be one PID for everything. Why do we have this diversity? Whereas if you come from a research background, you're like, well, of course there's different PIDs because we're all doing different research. We're all special snowflakes, essentially, and we need something to fit our niche thing. And that PID doesn't fit our niche thing. And I think that's actually why we're in the state that we are in because it's actually come and evolved from research rather than IT and some of the researchers have learned IT to build PID systems and coupled with IT people so I think it's worth making mm -hmm. that note. 
I have a, I have a quick question. Here. This goes actually. Can I ask a quick question, Josh? Sure. Like just um. So if we if outsiders think of the Crossref funder registry, or they think about grant IDs, or we just talked about DMP IDs, or they think about journal articles or data sets using DOIs, those are all that's all DOIs. So there's different branding of communities using DOIs. Of course, DOIs are themselves handles, but there is a group of people who have said the funder registry, you know, but it's just DOIs. Re3 data, repository IDs, that's just DOIs. So well, how does that fit into some of the kind of comments like Natasha just said about how people bring in their own communities and think it doesn't really fit? Like, because there are certain things that have just happened through the same back end, but with different communities and different labels in that way. Well, I think it's the balance again between um, you know the the biodiversity um, is there for a reason because there are lots of little niches and you know, you can flourish in those. Uh, I think what we probably need to think of is then okay then when you're interfacing with uh, the rest of you know that that's a good place to put your roots down or you know I'm really struggling with the metaphor now as I make it up as I go along, but uh, that gives you the strength. Um, it's the other things we need to, I think Chris, again, Chris Schiller was talking about having different frameworks for some key things that, that when we're uh, interfacing with the rest of the, the community that they don't you know, open up every nook and cranny and find something totally different that I can't um, say, is this a PID? Is it even a PID? What do you do? Do you use it differently? So having, um, you know, like plants, there's a lot of diversity in the plant kingdom, uh, but they do have some pretty standard interfaces that they provide to, you know, pollinators and the sun and, you know, they've kind of got that worked out as a framework. So I think that's where... Uh, Chris was getting at with the framework of um, different um, your know, governance and um, technical and community. Okay, so um, any, I think we're running out of time, but any closing comments, any closing thoughts? All right. Yeah. Brilliant to, see the, brilliant to see all of the discussion in the, in the chat. That's been it's been really really fascinating. I'm glad we're going to keep that. Yeah. Uh, continuing some of those discussions in the Slack. Yeah, sounds great. So um, those that are, we'll, we'll say goodbye. Thank you very much. I'll applaud for the audience on behalf of the audience and um, uh, for people that are just joining. We um, this this recording here will uh, remain active. This link will remain active, and immediately after um, ending the broadcast, this link will become a recording that you can view. Um, we do have a Q and A session over or a channel over in Slack that you can continue the discussion. Um, and this URL will also have the chat, so you can come back and and review the chat and continue the discussion. So we do. Um, we're starting our next sessions in one minute. So go to Sketch. Um, find out where you'd like to go and uh, make sure you join the next Crowdcast link. Um, and we do have uh, two tracks going um, starting in about one minute. Thank you very much to all our speakers. <laughs>